Oh, looks like you have it there. Yeah. Um, so, um, so great. So, so, um, so welcome back everyone to, to, to the day of science seminar. Um, so, so today we have, so we have two speakers. Um, so, um, so still only, um, so one talk, so they'll, they'll be, they'll be giving the talk together. So it's going to be on, so, so learning to care capabilities and opportunities by, so the first part, um, and, and then the future vision, the first part will be by, by, so Matthew Seymour. Um, so he is a, a, so H, A, um, so, and, so, um, so Edna Benning, presidential, so, so professor of medicine. He's, he's the division chief of, of, so epidemiology, and he's an adjunct professor in biomedical informatics um, and population health sciences and family and prevent medicine at, at, the, <laughs> at the University of Utah. Um, he's also a director of the Salt Lake VA Informatics um, so Decision Enhancement and Surveillance Center, so IDEA Center, and the principal investigator of use so so CDC's funded so prevention epicenter and modeling infectious disease and healthcare so program. Um, so and then the second half of the talk will be by by Jeffrey Humphreys, who's a research professor in, in so internal medicine, has appointments in epidemiology and the health science and 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 so innovation and research, um, and has a BS in mathematics from Utah State. And then went and did a PhD at, at Indiana University, and then was able to come back to Utah. So great. So so I'm um, I'm so looking forward to, to to hearing a lot about this talk, um, especially from another um, so so Packers fan. Um, <laughs> I, I grew up in 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 Wisconsin. So oh my gosh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I've I, I've been a fan since Don Mikowski was the quarterback. Okay, well, I go back to Bart Starr. <laughs> oh, oh, oh boy! All right, a little bit before my time. <laughs> yeah, thank you for that very kind introduction. So we definitely would like to have an interactive discussion, and so uh, please feel free to to interrupt. I would do the same to you if you were giving a talk. So I think that uh, my slides are just a, f a little bit fewer than Jeff's. So. I'll try to, um, you know, set the stage, and uh, I'm going to, you know, talk about data science from an epidemiological perspective. Our, our program integrates informatics and biostatistics and epidemiology and data science, implementation science. We really cover a broad territory because uh, we, we're a very diverse faculty. We have a funding from different kinds of sources. Most of it supports applied research, uh, which I think uh, creates some interesting opportunities for collaboration with uh, the department, you know, uh, in the College of um, in the School of uh, Engineering and Computer Science. Hey, Matt, oh. listen, you might full screen it. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, slideshow. Yes, yes, yes. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Right here, here. Here. Okay, now, of course, I'm going to, uh, let's see. How does that? How does that look? Is that good? Uh, they just go, I would go to the display setting so it's just full screen. You're in the presentation mode. Oh, I thought. You, so if you go up to display settings, or, or or right now if you went up to slideshow, right there. Right, right, right. Well, I mean, you're you're, you're um. Oh yeah. Okay. All right. And then, um, then click on uh, just from the beginning or, or from slide right there, yeah. No. And that should do it. Now I have a, how's that? You gotta, <coughs> you gotta click on it. Uh, well, that's good enough, that's fine. Okay, that's good? Okay, great, thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, so, um, 
So the, the story uh, involves both the VA and uh, the University of Utah. Uh, so all of our VA investigators have uh, faculty appointments at the university. And uh, what's been possible at the VA is to build um, a group that um, has you know, not only VA funding, but a lot of related funding that builds on our affiliation with VA. And our, our affiliation with VA is really at a national level. And I'll discuss that a little bit when I talk about the data resources. And um, what I'm going to describe again uh, quickly, briefly, is the, the history of, um, of data science in VA and, and our part in it. And um, it, it's, you know, it, it exists within this broader fr framework that links these different disciplines together. And um, there's so much uh, application of data science and epidemiology yeah, and, and, you know, there's so much application of artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, more broadly. And, but I'm not going to just try to cover the water. I'm going to focus uh, in my last couple of slides on, you know, what, what our current state of the art is for comparative effectiveness. I, I think that um, in clinical practice and in public health practice, the limitation that's felt most acutely by practitioners is that uh, there's a lack of evidence to support decisions. And so uh, a study design that is very important for uh, generating new evidence and improving evidence is um, what we call observational uh, comparative effectiveness. Oops. Okay, so here are the discussion points, which I think applied to um, my portion of the talk as well as Jeff's, and I'm gonna repeat these at the end. You know, so what we try to do internally, but we're also trying to do and hope to do with our main campus partners is create synergies between different kinds of researchers and particularly, you know, basic scientists and applied researchers. And, you know, we're, we're trying to make data available even though there are barriers which are appropriate and needed because of the uh, protected nature of health, health data. Um, and, um, one of the reasons why we have the data science resources we do in the VA is the need to maintain very, uh, very strong security. Uh, so, um, you know, we have a lot of experience in, in, in trying to uh, make the data available within the secure environment uh, uh, to investigators who may not be, you know, for example, VA employees. We're also very interested and in keen to improve our linkage between you know, internal uh, data that comes from electronic health records uh, from care generated within a health system like the VA or the University of Utah, linking that data to external resources, um, which is, would be data uh, generated from other health systems, would be um, uh, data that may, they may come from wearable devices or other patient generated data. And um, the, um, you know, the resource that exists for us in Utah, the, the Utah Population Database, is a great way to create these linked data resources across different systems. But, you know, um, you know that only pertains to Utah data. And uh, so something similar is needed for national data. Um, and we, we want to um, promote collaboration, you know, which we think is a, a key mechanism to uh, enhance innovation. And, um, and then uh, in turn, um, there are opportunities where we can co-mentor and co-train uh, junior uh, faculty and students and fellows is another mechanism to uh, support uh, collaboration. And then, um, and then I would love comments and thoughts about how we can do a better job at performing high quality comparative effectiveness studies. We've had funding to try to you know, automate the process to some extent, uh, but this, this remains, in my opinion, a, a, a you know, real big challenge. Any comments so far? I'm going to try to make sure. I have to make sure I don't go too slowly here, so I got to watch my clock. <laughs> um, okay. Any comments or questions? Okay, great. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, so this is a perspective you know that is generated from my own experience, you know, at the university and, and at the VA. Um, so. Um, there was a kind of a seminal event, uh, you know, a, a terrible event in, for VA, where there was a, a huge uh, breach of um, 
confidential patient information. Uh, this was this happened about uh, 15 years ago, and uh, but this uh, this trauma, which almost shut down re VA research, uh, led to uh, or helped to lead to a couple initiatives. Um, one of which is called Vinci, which is the initiative that cr created a, a computational environment for accessing all national VA data uh, for, for research, and then ultimately supported accessing national VA data for operations as well. And uh, so this uh, entity, Vinci, uh, is actually headquartered in Salt Lake City. So this has become a, a very important resource for data science and for data management and, and epidemiology uh, for our own uh, investigators and for our program. It's, it's highly networked. It involves investigators and, and uh, scientists at other VAs as well. Um, at the same time, uh, in 2008, a, a new uh, program project was launched uh, called uh, Consortium for Healthcare Informatics Research. Now, this lasted about uh, four to five years, but, and then um, w w was not renewed uh, it felt that it was felt that the pur its purpose had been achieved, and its focus was on uh, creating an, an infrastructure and, dem and doing demonstration projects for natural language processing. And the goal was to, you know, make use out of the incredible resource that, that exists within VA, uh, for, because the VA has had an, ele an electronic health record now for about 25 years, um, and uh, this. Um, Resource includes, you know, billions of, of, of text nodes, um, and so, you know, what was needed was um, having uh, the capacity and the, and the expertise to do natural language processing on VA nodes, and then to uh, develop a, a variety of use cases for the application of natural language processing. Um, and it's, again, uh, the Cheer headquarters was also in Salt Lake City, but it, again, it was very collaborative, involved. VAs at, you know, in Palo Alto and, and Portland and Nashville and other, and Indianapolis, et cetera. And then, uh, you know, what happened for us locally was that our program of research, again, you know, linking informatics and health services research and epidemiology um, was uh, able to grow and uh, we were funded um, as a, a full-fledged you know, center of innovation in 2013, and that uh, is is the you know Salt Lake Idea Center. We called that um, yeah Salt Lake. I think we called it Salt Lake Ideas 2.0, and now we're on to a, a, another new round of um, of uh, funding, and we, we're now uh, Idea Center 3.0. Um, and so so this is a research entity with um, core support from the from VA Health Services Research. Okay, so um, I'm going to describe uh, a couple um, applications of natural language processing, processing, a couple of the tasks that were completed that you know, had you know, considerable impact. Um, one of them, and these may seem you know, mundane, they may seem you know, just maybe to you, they're not that impressive, uh, but uh, they were important in VA because um, you know the VA operates an electronic health record that um, you know is, is called Vista CPRS. The C CPRS is the front end, which actually was developed in Salt Lake City by VA um, uh, programmers and software engineers. And um, so the VA has this electronic health record that is. Uh, exists across all the different you know, VA hospitals and VA medical centers, but it's a different instance in each um, center. And so th there's a lot of variety in how things are uh, coded and or, uh, organized across different VAs. And, and um, up until you know, about 12 years ago, there was not a, 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 a data repository that had uh, all the VISTA data across all the VAs. And so this, this data repository, which we call the corporate data warehouse, is what made Vinci feasible. But again, a lot of the information, as I mentioned before, was not in structured form. And one very important type of data that was not in structured form was microbiology data. And I think we can all appreciate 
the importance of having national data given our current COVID uh, pandemic, that you know, some consistency and standardization across different um, clinical sites is extremely important to be able to assess tra transmission and spread, you know, not just at a local level, but at a regional and national level. And you know, so, the, so, so one of our first products was a national data resource for microbiology, which extended not just to organisms uh, that were isolated in culture and, and their antibiotic susceptibility, but also included uh, what's called um, barcoded medication administration data for administration of, of medications in, in uh, hospitals. And, and so that was a, a source of data that also was national that we created into a resource for uh, measuring antibiotic use. And so, uh, so these um, resources uh, in the case of microbiology required some relatively simple uh, natural language processing uh, pipelines. The initial developer of that pipeline was Scott Duvall and uh, two other people you see photographed and their photographs I've been here uh, are key um, leaders in our center, namely Mike Rubin and uh, Makoto Jones. Uh, so this is again, something that they spearheaded and, um, you know, it had a, had a big downstream impact on uh, infectious disease research and infectious disease practice in VA. Any comments or questions? So, uh, just as an example of the, what uh, the, these uh, data resources made feasible, was that. Um, you know, one direction of our work was to uh, develop, um, a, you know, a Bayesian models uh, where we could estimate transmission parameters uh, for antibiotic resistant bacteria. And one of our initial uh, uh, areas of focus was uh, methicillin resistant Staph aureus, otherwise known as uh, Mer uh, MRSA or MRSA. And so uh, with work led by Alan Thomas and Kareem K Cotter, who are photographed here, pictured here, uh, we applied, um, you know, we used MCMC procedures to estimate parameters based on this, these Bayesian models of transmission. But uh, in, in what was really unprecedented and has never been done before was to uh, take the individual level data from all the VA hospitals and all the VA nursing homes. You know, so about 2 million admissions, you know, almost 4 million surveillance tests and use these models to estimate parameters across the entire VA system. Um, and so, uh, you know, a key feature of the VA is that not only do we have the data across the hospitals and nursing homes, but we have all the outpatient data as well. So we, we have uh, outpatient visits, we have um, the ability to track individuals, to track veterans as they move between hospitals. And so this uh, creates, you know, um, the opportunity to do these uh, mechan you know, fit these mechanistic models. And again, these are methods that are exactly the same kinds of things that are relevant and key now to understanding, you know, transmission of SARS-CoV-2. You know, so um, uh, the methodological development and then the application of the met of new advanced methods was a, a key um, feature of our work that was made possible by, by the data science, by the, um, you know, by the creation of new data resources. So <laughs> um, another kind of task, and there's just so many examples here, you know, it's just not possible to um, describe them all, of course, but um, another kind of project illustrating uh, the approach um, was uh, a study of Gulf War veterans, uh, where, and this was led by a psychiatrist um, at uh, University of Washington and the Seattle VA, Ken Hammond. Um, and the, the interest was to try to extract information about adverse childhood experiences um, from the VA electronic health record. Of course, it's not documented in structured data. And, and so, this was a kind of multi-step process that involved both a rule-based approach, uh, the NEGX algorithm, which was developed by Wendy Chapman, 
and then to uh, also lay on top of that, layer on top of that, a machine learning model to distinguish true assertions from um, um, false assertions, or assertions that were not, um, you know, that were e uh, either not true because uh, they were part of a of a um, of a template in the node, or some, or, or for other reasons. And uh, so the model was trained, and the model and the model was applied. And then the epidemiological analysis was done to relate adverse childhood experiences and various health outcomes. Um, so, so this is work that's of a high interest to VA for a lot of reasons. Uh, but um, you know, it, it leads to new applications that are still you know still being worked on. Um, now, uh, I should add that you know we have. Um, uh, of course, applied for other grants. Um, we did make a shot on the goal for the um, Center of Excellence with the, the, the BD2K initiative and did not get that, but that did provide an opportunity to partner with the Million Veteran Program, um, which um, is the, the massive VA effort to uh, do genomic testing in, in veterans. Uh, so that's another opportunity that uh, some of our faculty are, are trying to take advantage of. Um, and if, if there's questions about that, you know, we can discuss that further. Uh, we did have a successful um, R25 award. So this was a, a project, a program co-led with Brian, uh, that Brian Chapman and I co-led. Uh, we called that the Descartes program. It was a, a summer curriculum uh, that was funded for three consecutive summers. Uh, and, and I want to thank you know, Ross Whitaker uh, for helping, you know, giving us some advice about uh, our uh, proposal. Um, and then uh, moving on, um, I, I, find, I, I want to finish with uh, a couple you know, examples of where we are currently linking data science to epidemiology uh, and you know, again, uh, doing the comparative effectiveness type study to generate new evidence. And these are two papers, these, these studies resulted in two papers published in JAMA Internal Medicine, which is a high impact journal. It shows you the level of interest in this kind of research in the clinical and, and health sciences community. Um, so uh, the, the first paper uh, looked at um, vancomycin and metronidazole, uh, or compared vancomycin and metronidazole for uh, treatment of uh, C. difficile infection, which is a, a major cause of diarrhea in, in, in individuals taking antibiotics. We wanted to determine whether uh, the outcome of infection depending on the treatment. Uh, historically, these drugs were considered equivalent, and uh, most recommendations were, for to, were to use metronidazole. At least um, uh, historically, this was the preferred drug because it was felt that it um, was cheaper and also had less impact on uh, antibiotic resistance. Uh, what uh, this paper, what this work led by Vanessa Stevens demonstrated was that, um, in fact, there was a difference in, in outcome um, such that uh, patients treated with oral vancomycin did better than patients treated with metronidazole. And so, you know, this was um, something that uh, had some support in other recent studies, but nothing of this scale. So this is by far the largest study of this kind uh, to examine and compare these drugs. Uh, propensity score matching was used. What I, what I wanted um, to reduce confounding by indication what I want to emphasize here and in the next slide is that uh, what you see is it may not seem to be a huge uh, sample size, you know, 50,000 50, individuals or so initially, uh, but, but, you know, the, to get high quality curated data of this size is, is other, it's otherwise very difficult. And so it, it um, you know, to, to generate high quality um, uh, epidemiological data or results that people have some faith in, in terms of the interpretation of an of a actual causal effect of comparing one drug to another, requires this very, in, you know, very close intensive analysis of potential confounders and, and other sources of bias. Um, and um, so, you know, so the, 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 this is kind of the discussion that I think is very interesting to contrast and understand and examine you know, the role of, of, of artificial intelligence, of machine learning, of other data science approaches to, uh, to improve the quality of these studies, to improve the efficiency with which we can do these studies. And so then my last slide, uh, this is led by, this project uh, 
It was led by Barbara Jones, uh, a pulmonologist. And uh, so this was something that I just recently published this year. Uh, and um, so here uh, we're looking at outcomes of treatment for pneumonia, comparing <coughs> um, uh, drugs that have anti, that have activity against MRSA with drugs that, that, that don't, the more standard regimens. The drugs with activity against MRSA are recommended when there's um, felt to be a higher risk for MRSA infection. And the important result was that, was to find that, that there was no evidence that anti-MRSA therapy uh, reduced mortality in patients at high risk, even patients with documented MRSA infection. So again, a very surprising result that, that depended on um, very um, intensive analysis of risk factors and, and predictors of outcomes to uh, improve the, um, you know, the, the rigor and to reduce the potential for confounding. Uh, for confounding. And again, another study that used propensity score matching. Um, so so I described this as our current state of the art, uh, but you know, that state of the art should move forward and should advance. Uh, and hopefully they'll do, we'll do that in collaboration with our colleagues in uh, artificial intelligence, data science, et cetera. And there's so much more that's going on in, in the data science realm that I'm not describing, uh, but I, I just wanted to set the stage for some discussion. So I, I close with the discussion points again. I think I'll, I'll just let the, uh, Jeff take the ball from here. But before moving to Jeff, any, any other comments, any questions or comments? Um, so I've got a question. So, so maybe this will be answered by Jeff and, and so we can just delay the answer. But so it, it, it seems like there are a number of points where this intersects with, with data science. And I'm just wondering where do you think is the most ripe area for collaboration with other people? Is it kind of the, um, the kind of trying to see how these analyses change or what else can be done with, with machine learning? Is it more of the data wrangling and the management because yeah. you're dealing with these 50,000 kind of this, this messy data? Um, or is it something else? Would, 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 would Viz, you know, adding some good Viz to help sort through this be helpful? Right. Um, Right. Yeah. Yeah. No. I think it's all of the above, and the this is very important for decision support. And, and we've collaborated uh, with Ski a lot in the past on uh, visualizations for population health decision making. Um, and so um, the program that that we that um, Yarden Livnat developed uh, was uh, is called Epinome. So and the, another program was Common Ground. And so these are uh, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm a huge believer in, in the importance of visualization for data interpretation and for decision making. Yeah, so, and, so, but, and, and all the things you mentioned that, you know, everything from having an infrastructure that you can process data quickly and efficiently, you know, having uh, better tools for predictive analytics for prognostication. Um, you know, there's a, a big role for anomaly detection. There's a big role for, um, you know, for exploratory data analysis and, and clustering and, and, you know, non-supervised learning. So, um, in, in, a, in a really, I'm interested in where you know reinforcement learning you know can intersect with causal inference. You know, and I, I really want to understand how the perspectives of different disciplines you know interact with each other and can uh, improve upon you know how we learn from each other. Um, so uh, th th those are all great topics that you brought up, Jeff. So thank you, <laughs> and maybe we should let Jeff Humphreys take it from here, and we can come back to those questions. Jeff, did, did you want to? Did you do you want to take over the? Um, yeah, okay. Just, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I'll stop sharing then. So thanks, Matt. We'll, we'll. I'm sure we'll thank you again at the end. Yes. Yes. Was, thank you. As, as a nice as you're doing this, that was a nice introduction to kind of this huge kind of infrastructure organization you have. Um, yeah. Thank you. On there. Okay. All right. Do I need permission to share the screen? You, you should have permissions. I, uh, I there we go. Okay. I think there's a down at the bottom. There's a green button. Yeah. Great. Got it. All right. Yep. Yes. Looks good. Oh, wait a second. Nope. That's the wrong set of slides. Oh. Um, Matt, your slides are here. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, no, I want to say I see Ahmad Hawani 
on this call. It's in, 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 and Ahmad is doing some very innovative things around comparative effectiveness that hopefully we can get back to in the discussion. Oh, great. Yeah. Thanks, Matt. I'm here. Yeah, okay. great. Thank you. Start. Okay, can you? Oh, uh, yeah, great. Perfect. Did the old fashioned way here. Okay. All right. So uh, uh, thanks for letting me uh, come and, and, and chat. And um, I, uh, I'm, I'm new faculty in the Division of Epidemiology. I started in January. Um, and so just I thought I'd give kind of a quick introduction to my background and where I come from. Um, I, uh, my, my educational training is in mathematics. Uh, I got my PhD uh, in uh, applied math at uh, Indiana University studying uh, differential equations. Um, went to Ohio State for my postdoc and then I took my um, first faculty position at BYU uh, in the math department. Um, and um, you know, had a, a, a for, for, for a math department, unprecedented number of students in my lab. I'd, I'd learned from physicists uh, in my undergrad and uh, on how to run a lab and, and mathematicians, like, like the median number of graduate students that a math professor would have would be zero <laughs> because, you know, most of them aren't currently mentoring anybody. And so I had, you know, I, I went and I got space and I had a big lab and I bought, got a bunch of computers and, and had like a, you know, what, what you might see in a, in a computer science department as, as my lab and was training up a bunch of students. And, and, and part of the reason why is because at BYU, if you want good grad students, you have to raise them as undergrads. Um, people aren't going to come to BYU who weren't already at BYU for the most part. You'll get a few from the U that are, you know, uh, from the area or whatever, but like for the most part, you have to grow them uh, yourself. And, and uh, yeah, so, so that was sort of the, you know, have a, a huge, huge army of undergrads and then, and then pick a few to, to, to have as grad students. But I, you know, I, I mentored 27 graduate students in the um, 13 years that I was uh, faculty at BYU. Um, 2009 was a big year for me. I, I, I got a career award. I got tenure and my father died of cancer all in the same year. It was kind of crazy. But it was sort of that moment where, A, I'm tenured, I can now think about different things. B, I've got a big grant that I can apply however I want, basically. And then C, um, you know, I, this, this experience with my dad passing away was um, sort of transformational and like, I didn't want to do fluid dynamics anymore. Um, and so, um, you know, made the transition and then starting in, um, uh, the next year, I started consulting for United Health Group, and and that was the lens that I I learned healthcare from was you know working with actuaries, being a data scientist, and then um, you know solving complex you know computational problems, um, and and that grew into machine learning on claims data. Um, to give an example of of you know, why a company like United Health would be an early adopter of machine learning in health. Because machine learning in healthcare wasn't sexy in 2010. It's sexy now, but 10 years ago, it, it you know, it, it was not all the rage like it is now. Um, and, uh, but, but, but the, one of the main uh, vehicles for United Health Group uh, is Medicare Advantage, uh, where they um, basically insure 4 million seniors on behalf of the federal government who pays them a premium for, uh, based on people's health conditions. Um, and like, if you have no health conditions as a senior, the federal government will pay United Healthcare, you know, $12,000, um, maybe 13. Uh, if you have kidney disease and diabetes, it'll be more like 25,000 for a year. Uh, maybe 30,000. So it's, you, you get a premium based on the person's health conditions, um, and, but they have to be documented and they have to be redocumented every year. So if you're an amputee in 2019, starting January 1st, you are no longer an amputee unless the paperwork gets done. You know, so it's like even the, the most common sense chronic diseases, which never change, that, you know, this is the federal government. You still have to document and redocument everything. So, so you have this huge population of people who are walking around with diseases for which United would get paid, you know, 10,000 or more dollars for if they can get the documentation for it. And in many cases, you know, they've never been diagnosed. So you have to predict who, who is at risk of having a disease, walking around with it, and then get them somehow to get to a, a 
uh, somebody who can diagnose that and legally fill out the paperwork and get that submitted. So United Health, people, most people don't know this, has the largest workforce in the world of nurse practitioners. They send nurse practitioners in 1.5 million people's homes every year to do this paperwork. The scale of this is profound. And so there, there was a lot of focus and, you know, on, on how to use machine learning to identify who is likely to have diseases and, and for those that, you know, are most profitable, go after them, get the documentation done so that we can get paid. That was kind of the focus for several years. And so I was very involved in a lot of initiatives around that. Then in 2014, I became a full professor and I launched what's called the ACME program. This is Applied and Computational Math undergraduate degree at BYU. You, but we basically treat it like a master's degree program. It's extremely mathematically rigorous, very intense program, and it produces about 75 graduates a year now that uh, it is the highest paid undergraduate degree on BYU's campus. Uh, it is thriving and doing really well. I don't know if, if there's any ACME students uh, that have come to the U uh, yet, but um, Goldman Sachs hires a lot, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, they, they come and, and in fact, um, we've won um, I want to say four of the last six ACM coding competitions that are statewide with the ACME group. Um, so they're very good programmers. They're very good mathematicians. And, and um, this, is, this is something I'm very proud of. So uh, I created this uh, going back into 2009, and then it didn't get launched until 2014 because we had hiring freeze with the bad economy. And, uh, and then um, still very involved in the program, even though it's, it's, it's a hobby. I don't get paid for it. Um, and then in 2017, United reached out to me and said, hey, we want you to come in full time and build a data science team with the ACME program. And so I did um, and uh, I built a team of about 40 data scientists for some initiatives. And then um, my focus was on diabetes, pediatrics and neonatal health. Um, is part of my role in that I evaluated a lot of companies uh, that were pitching for fu uh, funding for United Health. United Health is the biggest healthcare system in the country. It's a $220 billion company. It's the Fortune 5. So um, this is a big monster, and, and they, they fund a lot of healthcare initiatives, um, even ones that you probably wouldn't realize they're involved in, <clears throat> and fund a lot of startups. So uh, during that, I... I came across Outlet um, when I was because I was covering pediatrics and um, and I really loved the company. I evaluated them. I recommended United invest in them. Um, and uh, and then a few months after their pitch, I uh, kind of kept in touch. I I sent some of my students their way to to get hired um, to help them kind of build their data science team. And uh, and then I joined as VP of research there uh, about a year and a half after I started at United. And they're here in Lehigh. Um, and uh, built out the next generation of a couple devices and have end-to-end -end deep learning stacks. It's really, we really have an exceptionally uh, good technology uh, that's come out of this company. And then um, I still advise for this company, but um, I uh, joined the Division of Epidemiology uh, in January. So um, that's kind of my background. Um, I've, I've written two books in data science. If you're interested in being very mathematical in your approach to data scientists in data science, these are, uh, about the design analysis and optimization of algorithms from a very rigorous mathematical standpoint. And then I'm working on uh, writing volume three right now, which is the, is the, the modeling with, with data and uncertainty volume, uh, that will, that will cover more of method methods of data science, but this gives you the preparation and background to really learn your linear algebra well, your multivariable calculus really well, and then your, you know, your computer science algorithms very rigorously, your approximation theory and your optimization theory, um, all tied in. And so these are combined about 1500 pages of textbook. It, it's, it's been a, a real effort, uh, and a passion for me. So, um, okay. So anytime I give a talk about AI or anything AI related, I say, well, what is intelligence? Because you can't talk about artificial intelligence until you first talk about, well, what is intelligence? And a lot of people will throw out different opinions or different like sense of like, you know, it's, it's your ability to make good decisions. It's like, I know a lot of intelligent people that are horrible decision makers. So it certainly can't be about decision making. I would say decision making is more about wisdom than it is about, um, uh, you know, uh, intelligence. But, but if you think back to Shannon and, and the idea that um, any sort of 
data science, you know, classification algorithm, or even a even a unsupervised learning algorithm is really coming down to the notion of compressibility of a signal. And so that's kind of where you get the Shannon play that that intelligence is the ability to find patterns in information. That is like the hallmark definition. And that's what distinguishes us from the animals and and, and there are areas in which animals are more intelligent than us because they are better at detecting certain patterns of information with certain sensors that they have. But for the most part, that's, that's what distinguishes levels of intelligence in different categories. So, so that's what, it, what is AI. AI is the, the, the finding of patterns in information via algorithm. Um, and if I were question. to give a, Oh, go ahead. You don't mind? I, I hope you can I ask a question. Sure, please, yes. Okay, so... Um, I've actually did a little research on some of this, and uh, when when Alan Turing published like a uh, the origins of he defined it as like solving existing knowledge and reasoning. Uh, do, do, do you agree with that? No, not at all. Um. <laughs> So, so, so say that one more time, though, because I. What is Turing? I, I don't just a second. Know anything. <laughs> What's okay, that? So you know Alan Turing, right? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> but but you, you 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 for me you cut out just for a, a couple seconds in the middle, oh. so I didn't catch the whole sentence. Oh me. Yeah. Okay. So um, when Alan Turing first like introduced AI in the fifties, um, he defined AI as like using existing knowledge and reasoning to solve problems. Yeah. So uh, you agree, really agree with that? Not at all, no. Okay. Um, because existing knowledge is based on our a level to perceive, our ability to um, understand. So that would be like saying, oh, well, if, if, if Skynet came and some, some you know, robot came that like was a thousand times smarter than me, I would and call that artificial intelligence by that definition because it's not using existing reasoning. Like, like, like existing reasoning is constrained to our abilities, not to what is inherently intelligent. Oh, okay, okay. Right, you've got to be, you, you know, and then that's why I'm like, no, it's, it's, it's patterns and it's information theory, it's compressibility. If you can compress a signal, then you are, you are, you know, um, using intelligence. Okay, so is Alan Turing incorrect then? <clears throat> Um, I, I would say that everybody from the 50s who talked about AI by today's lens was absolutely incorrect, yes. Um, <laughs> even, 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 even the early part of this century, like, 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 the, like, like, like in the 90s, they were talking about Deep Blue as being artificially intelligent. Nobody today is going to say that Deep Blue is artificially intelligent when it beat Gary Kasparov in 97. They're going to say, no, no, that had a lot of lookup tables and a lot of like Grandmaster uh, giving you know, uh, you know, advice and getting that programmed in that that's not pattern recognition, you know, that's not actually intelligence. But in the 90s, it was a it was a hallmark moment. And and everyone then was talking about it as artificial intelligence. Right. So, and so, so, and so Watson was all, IBM Watson was, was also not artificial intelligence. Yeah, yeah. Watson's and Watson's been a disaster in healthcare. like, 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 it, it, it's, it's just so underperformed that if I were to name the top 20 best AI companies, IBM's not on the list. You know, it, it's just like, like you know, they, they, they got the hype game, they, got, they won Jeopardy, great, awesome, not an AI company by like serious standards. So, oh. so <laughs> but like, oh. those I've said, I'm very opinionated. <laughs> so. Hey, can I ask a question? This is Lynn Bacon. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, I don't want to kind of go further down this road unnecessarily, but you know, the Shannon Weaver information theory is doesn't have anything to do with the meaning of anything, right? It just has to do with compressibility or like the length of a, a message to kind of contain a certain amount of information, right? Yep. But it and doesn't it, have to do with any kind of meaning or interpretation. Exactly, exactly. And 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 that that you know, you're, you're right. And at the same time, what is the the you know, if you think about you know, machine learning tasks, if, if you don't have compressibility, you can't do anything, right? If you have a random signal, there is no pattern to match. There is no performance. You are, you, you're, you're coin flipping is the best you can do at that point, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. compressibility is what al allows you to reduce something down to pattern matching. And, and so we don't talk about it a lot, 
into like that's the that's what the missing piece is to be able to do machine learning but you can't do machine learning if you can't compress your signal and this really what a classification or regression task is is it is the com it is a lossy compression you are reducing a complex high dimensional problem down to what side of a decision boundary am i on or how close am i to some glob of other data points or, or something like that. Like you're, you're, you're making a, a statement about, you know, dimensionality reduction, which is compression and, and, um, you know, learning based on other sample points that, that are similar and trying to make generalizable insights around that. That's data compression at its core. And so, yes. Whether you're doing it well or or whatever, it, it, there there are so I, 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 maybe I, maybe I won't say that that that's all it is, but it's it's definitely like what allows you to have intelligence. Yeah, so you're basically saying it's necessary but not sufficient for intelligence, right? Yeah, yeah. You, need to, you have to have pattern recognition and discrimination things that kind of operate on kind of a sensory and perceptual level. But yeah, it's not, that's not the entirety of intelligence, right? Pr proving that something's sufficient is, is uh, one of the hardest things in the world to prove. But, well, of course. But, <laughs> but, but, but necessary is, is a lot easier to prove. No, it's, it's, I mean, yeah, is that the end of intelligence is once you can compress your intelligence? Um, I'm going to say, yeah, you're right. There, that's a valid point. There's, there's a next step that's going to have to be taken once you can compress a signal. Well, that's probably true because I often feel compressed but not very intelligent. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, thanks for your answer. All right. So, um, so um, maybe I can just throw one more bomb in there. It looks like it might be getting into your next slide anyways. But, you know, I would have agreed with you fairly wholeheartedly about, uh, about five years ago. But it seems like neural nets nowadays are doing something that might be closer to um, actually interpolation of, of the data as opposed to compression of the data. Um, and I know this is still up for debate. An active area, but you know, I'd like to throw that point in there. No, that, that's a that's a, a an interesting um, way to to uh, uh, describe it. But at the same time, um, you know, interpolation I, I, it is not. It, I, I would say interpolation is also a type of data compression. Um, in that you are making an assertion about data that is that is um, you know yet to be seen or or, or um, you know it is it is a it is a reduction of complexity down to um, a, a, a smaller space and and so from a dimensionality reduction standpoint you're you know that is still a, a, a form of of compression. So if I'm saying I'm taking, you know, all, all continuous functions and representing them as best I can by a, you know, set of, you know, 10 polynomials or something like that, a linear combination of polynomials, let's say, um, or some finite basis, um, and where it satisfies these constraints on these data points or, or approximately satisfies them, then that, that, that is still, I'm going to argue, a, a compression task. Um, uh, so anyway, that, that'd be fun to, to explore that some more. Okay, so um, brief and snarky history of neural nets. Uh, I, I don't know how many students are on the call, but um, you know, we sort of had you know neural nets coming out in the late '50s with perceptron networks, and and uh, you know it's 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 you know there's the old joke that neural nets are the second best way to solve every problem, and genetic algorithms are the third. Like like this was not a successful field really until about 10 years ago and then it really exploded it started winning competitions left and right and um one of the th one of the things that you know when i when i teach students uh, and young data scientists about neural nets i you know they're like yeah a lot of people will make a lot of of hay on backprop you know that is this algorithm it's just like but yeah but backprop is not that different from a bunch of other you know, backward induction like algorithms that already existed at that time. Yes, you get the chain rule piece that's nice. I don't want to take anything away from that. But, but, you know, neural nets didn't all of a sudden take off with great performance in the 80s when backcrop was was developed. Um, it, you know, it was the it was Moore's law, it's GPU, and the ensembling effect that you get with stochastic gradient descent. And that's really something that gets undervalued. People talk about the stochastic gradient descent as 
a way to improve computational complexity of solving an optimization task, but it's actually so much more than that because between mini batches, you take a step. And when you, between mini batches, by taking a step, you actually have kind of an ensemble of steps when you're done. And that ensembling is, gives you effectively, you could think of it as a different law surface that is very regularized. So the, the regularization that you get um, from, 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 you know, doing stochastic gradient descent on mini batches gives you almost all the gains from these other regularization tricks, um, you know, batch norm and drop out and all of that stuff. It, yeah, they, they'll give you a, a slight improvement, but, but if you just do stochastic gradient descent with the architecture that you, you know, found to be optimal for the task, that's going to get you almost all of the returns that you need and, and is extremely powerful. So it's, it's, and it, and it is, you, 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 we should think of it, you know, even this maybe not formalized, formalized that way, but as kind of an ensembling um, uh, of learners, uh, because each mini batch gives a different loss surface and taking a little step from each one of them is an ensemble of, of steps. So anyway, it's a, it's an interesting, um, uh, uh, way to, to, to think about it, but it's, it's, that's really where the, the big gains, um, uh, come from. So, and then, you know, of course, you know, in the last five years, this field is, I would say the fastest moving field in recorded history. Um, I wrote a paper, uh, with my lab in like 2017, um, uh, where we, um, uh, you know, it was a, it was a different training approach for neural nets and, and we posted on the archive and 96 hours later, somebody took our paper, made an improvement and posted like a three or four page archive paper. And then there was a Reddit thread, it called it the 96 hour paper because they got even better improvement from what we were doing. Um, you know, and then we never submitted the paper, even though it's got like, you know, a reasonable number of citations. It's just funny that like, you know, four days later, uh, somebody beats our paper, uh, you know, and, and like, you know, what a, what a funny <laughs> world to live in where, where, you know, uh, a week later, your paper is obsolete. So, um, and, and I've been at conferences where the same thing has happened, where the person who's speaking is a little embarrassed because the person, one of the people in the audience has already beat their algorithm, but given the six month lag from submission to when they speak in the conference, I was at an L ICLR conference a few years ago and this happened, it was one in Puerto Rico in like 2016. And the person was just mortified that they were speaking about something that was obsolete. Um, so, um, you know, we've got MNIST as sort of classical examples. Um, that, uh, you know, sort of how you start um, moving on, you know, understanding why a convolutional network works though, like, like seeing that this, this improvement finally beats human performance with a convolutional neural network, um, but understanding why is a kind of a really important step um, that, uh, you know, like, like when, I, when I talk to students and young data scientists, it's like, it's not just magic, like, it, you know, it's, it's that the, 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 when you look at all of these other methods, when they, look at an image, they stack it as a 784 dimensional vector that then gets fed in. So each of these pixels are orthogonal to each other. And there, so there's, you know, there's no difference between one pixel and another in terms of its relative or local importance. But the convolutional network as it sweeps these filters across these images um, makes sense of things that are close together by doing that reduction and then is learning based on those. So a lot of times people talk about it as, oh, these are, it learns filters and stuff like that. It's like, yes, that's true. But what makes this so profoundly good is that it's making sense of adjacency in an image. Um, and that is a compression task because things are similar when they're adjacent um, in a, um, in a, uh, uh, in an image uh, and, and and so anyway so that's you know and then and then as, as we say okay well then let's apply this to sort of the next round of of complex images with cfar 10 and and you know again getting you know this this amazing performance that's superior to human performance um and then saying well now image net with a thousand labels like 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 i could never sort images into a thousand labels like that overwhelms 
the human with with a number of the labels and 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 you know yet the the neural net is able to to pull this off with you know now about 90 percent accuracy so these are these are sort of you know but but it's this it's this ability to basically find make use of locality um, is what the architecture of the convolutional neural net does well and and that's profoundly good in images and and other things for where where adjacency matters um, a great example though and this is this is one that, that I really think is important to understand is that the convolutional neural net can tell the difference between an African elephant and an Asian elephant these are two different labels in the image net and and on you know some image you run it through and you say wow it it is that confident that this is an Indian elephant compared to an African elephant which is 96 percent versus 1.7 percent um, that's profound to, to be that confident. And so, you know, a human looks at the difference between the two and can easily tell the difference because, you know, you, you say, well, how do you tell? I and mean, if you're talking to a kid that's learning about elephants and you explain it to him, you say, oh, well, the African elephants have big ears and the Asian elephants have little ears. And that ear size is how we tell the difference. Well, they also have different number of like nodules in the trunk and, and a, a few other differences as well. The, you know, you know, you can see that the African elephant is a lot more wrinkly, uh, the ears, don't have the same flaps and things like that. So there's some other perceptual differences, but those aren't the ones that we talk about as humans. In our human intelligence world, we reduce the algorithm down to look at the ears. Um, the neural net learns different things. It does look at the ears, but but the, the you know if you look at at the different you know um, uh, you know. Uh, VGG or some of these other architectures that are good at solving this task, they're not deep enough to really capture the whole ear. It, you know, if you get little three by three filters, you know, you're not covering this whole space. So it is looking, there's the, you do see activation lighting up on the ears, but, but it, is, it is finding different things and still getting really high confidence on whether it's an Indian elephant or an African elephant. And so, I guess the, the moral of the story is, is that the, 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 the features or the, you know, the, what it finds in the data um, is different than what the human is going to find. And from my perspective, this raises big questions about interpretability and the value of that. A lot of people in the healthcare space are saying, well, if it's not interpretable, I don't want to hear about it. And I'm like, but wait a second. Interpretability isn't about a limit of the algorithm. It might be a limit of, of the human brain, right? You're saying you have to be able to communicate it to me in a way that I will understand or I'm not going to trust it. And it's like, well, okay, but what if there is a very clear algorithm that makes a lot of sense in 14 dimensions and the neural net's like, yeah, this is a no-brainer. Just look at it in 14 dimensions. Um, that is... That, that is a, limit, a human limitation that makes that not interpretable, not a AI limitation. Here's a great example. Google has studied, you know, retinal scans and the task for which they are the most successful of all of them. They've got, you know, good recognition on cardiovascular disease, anemia, smoking. They can get age within three and a half years. They can look and, and get blood pressure within some bound. But they have essentially 97-ish percent accuracy on gender. Now, I, I'm not an ophthalmologist, but I will bet $100 that an ophthalmologist would not be able to look at retinal scans and classify gender with even 55% accuracy. Okay? There is nothing that a human is going to look at a retinal scan and say, oh, yeah, that's definitely a male. And, oh, yeah, that's definitely a female. And yet, a convolutional neural net can do it with 97% accuracy. So, so... And, and if you look at the activation, you know, places, the places that light up in the filters, it's, they're all over the place. It's not zoning in on the fovea or the macula or, you know, some, you know, it, it's, it's some vascularization. It is a little bit of fovea. It's a little bit of macula. It's a couple of other parts of the retina. Um, but, but it's a combination of a lot of different parts of it that give a very strong signal. I mean, if you get, if you get, you know, uh, area under the curve of 97% in a classification task, you have crushed that classification task. And in a real healthcare environment, you should never expect to see anything better than that. If you see better than that, you've probably got a mistake. <laughs> so, so this is as good of a classification task as you're going to get um, uh, in, in an AI space, pretty much. And yet, you know, it's that confident. So whatever patterns it's finding are not human perceivable. The dimensionality or the resolution are such that the human isn't seeing it. 
and the AI is. And that is valuable. We shouldn't dismiss it because it's not interpretable. Um, you know, one, one great example, though, that, that I, I love to, to present is, you know, when Microsoft Research Lab did this wolf versus husky, you know, given that huskies are the University of Washington uh, mascot, uh, wolf versus husky, they were able to get really high fidelity in predicting the two. But when you peel back to see what's activating, it was really a snow detection algorithm. And huskies are taken into people's homes and yards. Um, wolves are taken out in the wild. And so almost all the wolf pictures had snow and almost all the husky pictures didn't. And so that's really what it was learning. So, so just as a great example, there, there was another study, um, I, I was looking for it, but I couldn't find it. So um, where, where they were looking at uh, chest CT scans and uh, uh, the, all of the images had a little bit of writing on the side with the diagnosis or whatever uh, by, by the radiologist. And um, they, they just were ignoring that in the, you know, as they were training on it, um, they're just idle. They, they won't pick up on that. And it was really just learning how to read the notes uh, to, in the prediction task. Um, those were, you know, what we're activating is, is uh, it, it, it was it was reading the notes to say what it was. And, and uh, you know, so you just, you have to be careful. That's like, you know, that's the caveat to, to doing all this. And that's where, you know, you say, okay, yes, interpretability, I don't think matters, but what does matter is that you're sure that you have trained your data well and that you've analyzed what it's looking at to make sure that it's not snow or physician notes so that you get true generalizability. Um, and, uh, and so that's part of what you've got to do, you know, in a healthcare setting so that you're not inviting disaster. Um, another great, place that where there's a lot of healthcare opportunities are in, in uh, generative adversarial networks. You know, this is, you know, got a lot of buzz about, you know, uh, the ability, you, you, you train the neural net and then you can draw from it as a probability distribution and get, um, you know, uh, uh, inputs that look a lot like what you've trained on. So like in the case of the MNIST, you know, on the left are, are these, you know, actual numbers and on the right are drawn from, you know, distribution around the label, um, you know, randomly generated attractive people because you trained it on Hollywood people who are, you know, clearly more attractive than, than most of us. So, um, and, and then you randomly generate, and these aren't real people. These, these are fake people, but, but, you know, they sure look like a little bit of a couple of different people. And so, um, you know, this has been a, a, a real growing area in, uh, in, in AI. Um, you know, uh, one of my favorite examples um, is uh, the ability to uh, take an image and reconstruct parts of it um, you know, like, like in the, you know, in, in the eighties and nineties and you'd watch a movie and there'd be some like smart nerdy guy that would like take an image and like zoom in on it. And then they click a button and it would like improve the image, you know, and, and, and as, as like, as if that's a thing. Um, and, and then, you know, oh, well, we just keep zooming in on this thing and we can get whatever resolution we want and then find out who the murderer is. And, and it's like, well, that's not real. And, and everybody that, you know, knows anything about image analysis kind of laughs about it. But, um, but what's interesting in this case is if you train on all possible, you know, license plate combinations and then start to pixelate the license plates, you know, knowing a priori that this is a license plate and taking all the combinations of what you would have and then pixelating it, you would probably actually be able to zone in on some very likely candidates for that. And that's kind of what's going on here in that, in it, by, by taking, you know, the, the real image and then taking the label, which is the, the better image, um, and, you know, you create, again, that can draw a, an, an image that is close to the label. Um, and, and then, but it's all cleaned up and it looks beautiful. And then you can get the output from it. And so we're seeing this already in some healthcare tasks where you, you train with, you know, the, a, a high and a low resolution chest scan and then this algorithm is able to produce, given as an input, a low resolution, it's able to produce a higher resolution image. And that, that is something that we're starting to see. And here's a pathology task as well, where it's, it's taking a, a, a lower resolution image and being able to create a higher resolution image. So, so this is a huge opportunity, like in, in the cancer space, for example, where, you know, survivability 
uh, is so highly dependent on how soon you can diagnose that the ability to find smaller tumors that might not show up in a low resolution scan, the ability to clean those up and then find things is, is a massive opportunity for, for saving a lot of lives. Um, okay. Don't mind if I ask another question? Oh, Can sure. Yeah. Uh, I hope I'm not interrupting. I hate to interrupt. Okay. Don't mind at all. Okay, thank you. Um, with the AI being able to distinguish like identical looking things, just curious, can you use that thing to also distinguish between pictures of like identical twins? <laughs> That's a good question. So like, like, would that be like a, a Siamese network or what, what, what's the, there, there's a few, there's a few papers out there that are like that. I, I, um, I'd have to dig around a little bit to get some good examples, but, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, that, that's, a, that's an interesting question. <clears throat> I, I don't have an answer off the top of my head, but um, I've seen some things like that, though. I oh, okay, okay. Off the top of my head, don't and, uh, know what. And uh, another quick question is that, um, just curious, um, with this uh, like imaging enhancing thing, do you think we can also, um, do you think one day it's also, this is possible to use in case like, for example, if, if a if an archeologist or historian found like a very old photograph that was kind of like, that were missing some of the, its parts and they wanted to reconstruct what the photo originally looked like, do you think we can also use it for that? So, so there, there are, um, there, there's a body of research in, in painting, which is the ability to fill in that which is missing. So, so that's a different task than, than cleaning up an image or improving the resolution. Um, and and okay. one of the stars in that space, that's actually, um, th there's a lot of PDE work around that. Andrew Bertozzi at UCLA has done a fair amount of work on that. And then now there's some, some AI models around it as well. Um, and and that's, a, that's a great problem because that's easy to train. You can take something that's already beautiful, knock out some pieces of it and train on it and get that to fill back in as best it can and learn sort of likely fill in. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a different kind of task than improving a resolution but um, okay. not completely. And then, um, uh, about improving resolution, so like, do you think we could use it to like, you know, like for example, the Loch Ness Mon Monster Theory where some people have taken like some very like low resolution photos of what like, of what they think was the Loch Ness Monster. And do you think we can also kind of use this thing to kind of like use that to see like, was the picture actually real or like, was it just like, I don't know, a log floating in the water? That's a funny question. Um, I don't know. That, that's, a, that's a good question. What, what, the, the way that I draw intuition on how the, the GANs are working um, is, um, you know, that, that basically if you have a corpus of data of the high resolution, you can say, okay, okay what is, you know, you're almost basically saying what is the closest high resolution image that when you drop its resolution down looks like this. And, and it, that, that's sort of solving that inverse problem. And, and as long as you don't have a many to one relationship, you can, you know, even though it might change dimensionality vastly, um, you know, you're going to be able to solve it, you know, if, if you're not, you know, if there aren't a lot of different kinds of high resolution images that would give the same low resolution image. Um, and, and so there's a, there's a, a very, you know, there's a bound there on, on how well you're going to be able to do that. If you have enough data and you can solve, a, you know, you can put together a corpus of, of when I drop the resolution down, it, this doesn't become a many to one mapping, then you're going to be able to probably solve it with a GAN. But it's that relationship that I would look for in any kind of task where you're trying to say, can I, you know, I, I, can, can, I, can I go from a low resolution back to a high resolution? As long as it's not based on your corpus, a many to one relationship, you should be able to do it. I can talk more about that if, if that wasn't, if that didn't make any sense. But if I have a lot of different chest scans that give the same low resolution image, like, like, I mean, I can go low resolution to where my chest scan is a single pixel, right? And then it's not informative at all. So, so depending on how low resolution I go, will now turn it into my corpus is multiple pictures being mapped into the same low resolution image. The GAN's not gonna work for that. It's gotta be as, as close to one-to-one -one for it to be able to fill it in well. Okay, um, I, I'm completely out of time. So I was going to kind of talk about like, you know, RNNs and, and you know, some of these English language tasks, uh, you know, GPT-3 are, are becoming like transformational in their capabilities and seeing opportunities here for healthcare as well. Um, 
looking at EH, EHR data, you know, really funny examples of um, diagnosis codes of things that never happen, like pecked by chicken, initial encounter, pecked by chicken, subsequent encounter, pecked by turkey. It's a different code because a turkey's not a chicken. Um, burn due to water skis on fire, initial encounter, um, sucked into jet engine, subsequent encounter. These are actual diagnosis codes. You can Google them. Um, and, and so what the, the, the space of, of diagnosis codes is a massive high dimensional, very sparse space where there's even a lot of codes that will never get used in your, you know, I, I doubt the VA has a single di diagnosis code for burn due to water skis on fire initial encounter. Um, you know, and then of course, problem in relationship with in-laws, everybody has that. So, so like you've got this, you know, <laughs> Everybody who's married who has in-laws is going to have a problems in relationship with them. So, so um, you know that that balance of of there are some things that are, you know, never going to happen, and other things that are really just a function of is this person married, um, you know, and and therefore you know it's not really this unique thing. Um, it's really just uh, completely correlated with with some static covariate. Um, it makes this a, a challenging space. And so, you know, word embeddings has is, is really been successful in NLP tasks. Um, and, and we're seeing them being very successful in healthcare problems where you, you, you treat, you know, a person as a document, the, the words are the codes, you know, so it's not, you know, it's not the English language translation of the codes, it's actually the code in, in, the, in the languages, the diagnosis codes. Um, and then the sequence is, is you know the semantics or how those come together and 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 so you get a really nice dimensionality reduction where similar diseases group together and then when you put that in as an input into an artificial intelligent model a deep learning model you get really high fidelity predictions um, really important process, um, uh, architecture is graph convolutional networks. This allows you to map together different kinds of healthcare data and make sense of them as a group to, to represent an encounter or a touch point or an episode of care. And this paper just came out this year. Um, um, Edward Choi and his group at Google um, have done really good work on this. And so this would be a place that I would spend some time looking. So this yeah. is my last slide. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Say, Jeff, I think there's some application to exactly the kinds of studies that I was describing, you know, these comparative oh. effectiveness studies. Yeah, I absolutely. think we should really try to explore this, the application Indeed. here. Okay, so real quick, I just this is my last slide. I've got just a few free opinions. The the the, the price is is free, so so I, I, there's no warranty with with my opinions. Um, things to avoid. I think interpretable AI is overrated. I think we need to celebrate the places where where artificial intelligence is augmentable and different than human intelligence, so that the combo is superior intelligence. Um, you know, so I think we should embrace AI's ability to see what we cannot. Um, I, I, I always tell people hype is not a good business model. So I see certain companies doing a lot of very hypey things in healthcare, and I would not jump on those things necessarily. Um, you know, three or four years ago, Verily had their contact lens that was a continuous glucose monitor. They ended up killing that. It, 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 it didn't work very well, but it sure made a cool picture of seeing a little computer chip on a, on a contact lens. And so just be very cautious to not jump into that which that which sounds cool because it's it's got to have a good business model that's going to succeed things to watch um digital health wearables iot is growing twice as fast in the data universe as as regular healthcare data so so it's doubling every um uh like 18 months in the amount of of this kind of data that exists in the world. So, um, you know, even though it's been like, like, like Fitbit had a disastrous um, exit uh, in that they had the IPO at 2 billion and then they sold for 400 million to Google. So they lost, you know, 80% of their valuation um, post IPO is not a success story for the most recognizable wearable, but, um, the intelligence that is coming off of wearables is, you know, as it gets integrated into care, as companies like Cerner start um, working more closely with the wearables companies, we're going to start seeing disease management programs taking off. And there's a ton of opportunity there. Um, and then, of course, you know, pathology, radiology, imaging is already there's there's 
probably 500 startups there already. And um, if not a thousand, the amount of investments, you know, in the tens of billions. Um, and then, but other things to watch for is like, like with the wolves and dogs or wolves and versus huskies is be very careful about what bias you've got in your training data. Uh, architectures to learn, graph convolutional networks and GANs, I think are really hot stuff. Uh, temporal graph networks is, is looking really interesting. Um, and uh, I would definitely put time into that if you're if you're thinking about what to study next. And then um, I, you know, the white whale, the, the ultimate goal, uh, the thing we all want in healthcare is reinforcement learning to inform clinical pathways. It is going to be a very hard problem uh, to solve. So it's something that is always going to be on the table of the most most important healthcare problems that we want to be able to solve, but it's also going to be one of the hardest to solve. And so, um, you know, it, 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 it's it's in my in from my perspective the white whale. It's the ultimate goal, but it's also one where we're going to have a lot of dead ends and you know maybe almost kill ourselves trying to trying to get it. <laughs> and that's that's it. That's my comments. So. All right. Thank you very much. So I'm sure everyone's loudly clapping with their oh, with their mutes on. So thanks both of you for the, for the great overview of kind of the, the the these these like super cool projects you guys have been going on. Um, so we're a few minutes over time. So I'm you know um, I, it, it, it'd be great if if people have questions they can um, so maybe ask them to. I I have kind of one pressing thing that I think would be great to have have knowledge about there's there's a bunch of students here in the in day science there are a few of them on the call or or who are still on um how can students get involved or how can um you know me and my colleagues as faculty help you know help um students get involved in in some of these projects i i know when scott duvall i don't know if he's still he, he used to have this great line of students he was he was hiring um, but if, if there are other opportunities, it would be great to form a connection. Yeah, I, I love that. Matt, I'm sure, has plenty to say on that topic as well. But um, we've, we've already talked about um, joining uh, two different sort of seminars. Uh, Ahmad uh, and, and Matt have, have talked just earlier this week about forming a new seminar. And, and I think that that's probably the right place to start. And then from there, um, get sort of some invitations out for students to participate in research, uh, faculty as well. And, um, you know, when Matt and I have talked at length about, uh, you know, how main campus and the School of Medicine should work together, it's like, you know, main campus has a lot of really, really strong technical talent, some, some, some you know, deep knowledge in, you know, STEM areas. And, and you know, School of Medicine's got lots of problems and, um, non-trivial funding, and, um, and and we ought to marry that together, and um, you know, produce a lot of really great uh, research. I totally agree. I mean, Jeff, please, uh, Phillips, let's please follow up about that. Um, oh yeah, of course. It can be like a meet and greet uh, where people uh, talk about what their interests are and. And uh, yeah, so I think uh, we, need to, we, need, we need to create the venues that facilitate that collaboration and training and access to data. So yeah, please, I mean, this is a great start. So thank you for inviting us. Yeah, great, yeah, yeah. So let's stay in touch on this. Um, we had kind of some stuff planned for this fall that kind of fell apart when everything went, when uh, um, was going on mine. But the, the student base interested in this and and skill level is 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 definitely growing, um, and the faculty are you know yeah. like myself interested in collaborating as well. Fantastic. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah, so let's yeah. let's stay in touch. If if you guys create a seminar, we'd be happy to kind of um, or have one where students can get in touch. We'd be happy to um, have you advertise this, and I'm happy to help direct you if there are any kind of specific opportunities for getting students involved as, as this comes up. Thank you so much. And I think it was cool the way that Jeff and I actually ended up in the same place about, you know, the, the white whale being, you know, the generation of better evidence to support, you know, clinical practice and public health mm -hmm. practice. Yeah. 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 So I've got a dozen questions on stuff, but, but, you know, yeah. um, <laughs>
Yeah. We'll let, All right. we'll keep the conversation going. All right. Very good. Thanks so much. Yeah. Great. Great. So I'm glad you could come. So especially after having to cancel last spring. Yes. Yeah. All right. See you. Bye -bye. I'll actually stay on if people have more questions. Um, I'm, I'm happy to do that. So right. oh. I'm going to I have to sign off. But um, I have a question for, you, for both Dr. Phillips and Dr. Samoa. Oh, OK. Um, because after attending a few of these seminars, I find myself actually really interested in like kind of exploring the research areas in these things. So can you guys give me more information? In fact, also one day I'm actually planning after I graduate, I want to actually go to grad school, get a PhD. And this is kind of an area I'm really interested in. So do you think maybe, how do you think I can possibly get myself more involved in research in these areas? So I can give some generic advice, and that's like the way it works best within the school of computing is like talk to the professors you're taking classes from and help them direct you to that. And there's, you know, especially this semester, a lot of professors' time is really crunched, so there's more demand than there is um, um, from students and there is time for professors, but the persistent students are the ones who t tend to end up getting stuff. So you have to be a bit persistent. Um, but another thing I found is a lot of students, both undergrads and grad students, find really cool opportunities outside the school of computing with, with, with people like Matt. Um, and, and so I can try and connect you with some of those people, but um, Matt may have other things to say. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean, definitely feel free to email me, me and, and I can help connect you to other people. Uh, oh, sure. So, yeah. What's your email? Yeah. Uh, so I uh, definitely don't, I, I totally agree that you have, you have to be persistent and, and not give up. Sometimes people, people may not respond to your first email, so keep on trying. Okay. And, uh, okay, so another, another quick question before I go is, um, the, the, the Loch Ness Monster thing, like the resolution is something I'm actually a little interested in trying to explore that. Do you think that's a good idea or not? All right, I'm going to sign off. I'll let Jeff Humphrey <laughs> answer that. Okay. <laughs> I think that there are. Oh, 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 go ahead, Jeff. <laughs> oh, no. I, I mean, I think the main problem is you don't have any, like, machine learning is often predicated on having these, like, labeled data that you're trying to build a model that, that, um, that, is, is trained based on data where you have labels and there aren't any labels that we know for sure of the Loch Ness Monster. Um, so the, the, that's gonna be one of the main main challenges there. Okay, so that's why a lot of people have not been able to like de-resolute that image. <laughs> that may have something to do with it. <laughs> there might be other reasons that it might not exist. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> Funny, but still a lot of but this has like kept a lot of people wondering like what exactly is are those pictures of some people have wondered that's kind of what i'm getting at like a lot of like people have taken pictures of like things and people have like claimed it's something but not not a lot of people are sure because the images are so blurry and a lot of times unclear same with like all these other theories like with bigfoot and everything yeah so it, if if you look for patterns long enough you'll find something that looks like a pattern uh, <laughs> it it doesn't mean it's actually a pattern um, like quote, if, if you torture the data long enough it will reveal anything you want <laughs> yes <laughs> especially if yeah so so i i mean there's this whole world of like p hacking where you know if you keep looking for hypotheses in the same data set you'll find something that is less than a one in 20 chance of happening you know maybe once out of every 20 times you look right and so if you look at images enough and people are trying to take pictures of the, of the Loch Ness Monster there might be some things that happen to look like something that might be the Loch Ness Monster um, it d does not mean it's the Loch Ness Monster <laughs> Yeah, understood. Yeah, I think that tendency to perceive things uh, are, that aren't there is called apophrenia, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, actually, it's, it's, coincidentally, there's a recent book by, I think his, his name is Colin Dickey, where he talks about the Loch Ness, Loch Ness Monster and kind of describes the history of a series of fakes, which is kind of interesting to look at, perhaps. I think the book is called uh, Unidentified. <laughs>